and welcome to From the Rookery End. It is the end of the season, the final podcast of the 2023-2024 season. Um, and, well, it was another season. Uh, the best, the worst, who knows? We'll we have a bit of a discussion about that and where we're, we're at in our heads, I suppose, at the moment. My name's John, and uh, as we've been doing for 14 years, because uh, this weekend, uh, sun, this Sunday, is the anniversary of the first ever recording of From the Rookery End, uh, where it was myself, uh, and with me that night was Jason. Hello there. And with us also uh, was Michael. I was going to say I remember it like it was yesterday, but what I didn't realise was that you said Kike was the manager. Who were they playing? Valencia, Seville. That was Atletico Madrid. It was the night that Fulham played in the Europa League, or whatever it was called those days, uh, yeah. final, uh, with Roy Hodgson, uh, one manager, and Kike sanchez Floor as the other manager. Incredible bit of foreshadowing there, wasn't it? <laughs> I believe that was the first ever Europa League final. Ah, oh, well, there you go. That's Dave. That's Dave, who's one of the people we've gathered along the way in those 14 <laughs> seasons. Kidnapped. Some, yeah, kidnapped. He's hung around a little bit, but, you know, whoever knows what we've done. But um, we're, the four of us are going to have a chat about this season, um, which ended on, uh, on was it Saturday? It was Saturday, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and a lunchtime kickoff away at Middlesbrough. It ended about six months ago, John, but... <laughs> it, I don't think we need to talk about the game too much, really. It's more like what it means... For you at this point, at this point of 14 season, talking about Watford, Mike, how are you feeling at the end of this this season, really? It's really, it's a really difficult one to articulate because I enjoyed lots of it more than last year, for example, mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're using sort of an immediate um, comparison. It was, it was definitely more fun in a lot of ways than last year um, and much more enjoyable than the year before that, where obviously we got relegated from the from the Premier League. So the bits and bobs to to enjoy, but in terms of the overall trajectory of the of the football club, it's difficult not to feel a little bit downhearted, perhaps at the at the evident trajectory of the of the club. And it was another season not not really troubling the top, the right half of the table. Um, if anything, worrying about the about the other half. And from that point of view, you've got to be a little bit disappointed, if not surprised, because I think we knew when we saw the the depth of the squad in the at the end of the two transfer windows, it wasn't really going to be one that was equipped to to really challenge at the at the top. So I don't know. Look, I love. I've said in a in a post on Twitter, I think every time I'm at Watford and Zed Cars hits, I love it. I wouldn't be anywhere else on earth at every single time. I, I love it, whether it's 7.45 on a Tuesday or 3 o'clock on a Sun, uh, Saturday or half 12 on a Saturday or 8 o'clock on a Thursday or <laughs> 9 p.m. on a Friday, whatever it's going to be next year. It's the best place on earth and it's the best feeling on earth. So always grateful to have um, to been able to go and see Watford so many times. But looking forward to a break from, from them, to be honest. At, but... <laughs> To see what they can come back with next next year, next next season. So, ready for a break, but yeah, already excited about next year. I think I'm in exactly the same place, really. You know, the fact that we know it's Tom and we know Tom. I'm not overly excited and going, this is going to be a great season. But I am excited and interested about what's going to come next. Jason, you've uh, supported Watford for many seasons. Oh, yes. I'm not counting, but <laughs> a fair few. A fine season, a, no- a normal season, a Watfordy season. What about you? <laughs> Watfordy season, yeah. I um, had one of those moments at work today where sort of coming back from uh, getting something for lunch and had a flight of stairs to walk up with a Chelsea fan. Uh, and so the conversation went straight to football and he's like, so how was your season? So I had to sum it up as succinctly as I could within a flight of stairs. Um, and it was... How many managers you sacked this year? It, well, yeah, yeah, there was that. <laughs> yeah, when's he, when's he getting sacked? Yeah, all of that. So got, got that out of the way early um, and then moved on to, yeah, like Mike said, better than last year. There was some enjoyable stuff at the start. Then it all started to go downhill a bit. Then we changed the manager. Uh, and then we started enjoying it a bit more again. And although we weren't winning too many, we, we were seeing better performances. Hope we can keep hold of Tom. And, and yeah, let's look forward to next year. But glad, really, that this season is done. All on a flight of stairs, Jason. Amazing. All on a flight of stairs, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dave, what about you? Was there, did you have enough highs, really, to, to get you through, to be satisfied? I think just about. I definitely have started to feel, now we've got to the end of the season, my feelings about where we are have changed and have kind of, we've kind of moved from the phase we've been in over the last few seasons, which rightly or wrongly, I've still held a candle right till the end 
that we could still somehow get up, that we could somehow, despite all the tribulations, that we could somehow still make the playoffs or we could just get back. But this season, and we and we still, ha- you know, I was still feeling like that until, mid, you know, midway through this season, really, until, you know, the QPR game where Livermore scored his two goals. I think we were one point off the playoffs. And I was still thinking... We can do this. Like we, we're good enough to just be there or thereabouts. Maybe we can. Maybe we can just do it. Obviously, after that game, you know, we didn't win again for a long time, and and it all, you know, we know what happened. And now we've got to where we are, and now we're so far removed from where we were in terms of being in the Premier League and the squad, and feeling like we have realistic ambitions of getting there. I feel like we've come full circle almost appropriately back to the time when you launched this podcast 14 seasons ago, and certainly to the start to the moment when the Pozzos took over 12 years ago, which is mad in itself that, that they've been here for so long. But I feel like that's where we are now. We're back to the club that we were, a mid-table championship club with a squad that features some promising young players, some Odds and sods, some players that have been hanging around for a long time, some players who aren't that good, but we kind of like them a bit anyway. And there's a comfort in that. I feel I feel slightly comforted by that notion that we're kind of the Watford that I used to know when I was maybe in my early 20s, or certainly in my teens. But I'm also a bit sad about that as well, because... I've liked being amongst it in the Premier League, or at least feeling like we're one of the biggest teams in the Championship and we've got a chance to be there when it matters at the end of the season. It's not to say that we won't have a good season soon, next season or whatever. Things, Football's weird, fortunes can change. But it, it, on the other hand, it certainly feels that we might not be back in the Premier League for a long time. And I'm kind of wrestling with how that makes me feel at the moment, um, to be honest with you. Obviously, I still love going to Watford, love all the things around it, but it definitely feels like I've kind of, I'm kind of trying to come to terms and, and sort of make peace with the fact that we are where we are. I think that's an important thing to say, Dave. I don't think this is the podcast for recriminations and, and a deep look at, at what has happened under the, under the Pozzo's ownership and why we have ended up sort of full circle. But of course, we we ended up full circle and then some really because the debt attached to the club is significantly bigger than it was 12 years ago. And I think as as Watford supporters, we all have a right to feel a little bit. I was actually, get this, last Friday, I was at Luton. I had to go to work for for, for Opta at, at Luton. And I can tell you something now, the, 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 where I was sat was right in the, is the main stand in the old executive sort of area, literally surrounded cheek by jowl with 11,000 people singing anti Watford songs and mouthing off to, to Ashley Young. It's quite it's quite quite the experience. But anyway, I was talking to a to a, a, a mate of mine who is a Luton fan and he was saying how he he, he really enjoys it on a match day there because it just feels like such an event. It feels huge. It feels big. Every game is big. And we were there for a bit, like you said, Dave. We and we we enjoy, it's impossible not to enjoy it. I think there's a lot of talk about how, you know, uh, the championship is our natural place and being competitive and I think that all that is is true but in reality if you're part of the Premier League it feels big it feels important and we were there we and and we kind of you can't really escape the feeling that we blew it a little bit the year we went down we shouldn't have really um got relegated some mitigating circumstances obviously with Covid and so on and so forth we got back up and sort of surrendered that and now we find ourselves back here with what to show for it, obviously loads of memories and and loads of great times that we've we've spoken about on the on the podcast week in week out, which we'll f- forever be grateful for. But it's impossible, like you say, I think, not to feel a little bit melancholy at the end of the season because looking forward, it's we're probably not looking at promotion or or putting together a promotion winning side for quite some time, unless things change at the top unless there's massive investment or unless there's a, a takeover. And that looking back sort of which we're doing now, looking back at this season and, and then looking back at it in context with, with what we've seen over the past four, five, six, seven, eight years, it's hard not to be hard not to be sad. And is that because we, we don't know where the bottom is, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a feeling when you know you're at the bottom or, you know, you've, you've been down and you're coming back up again. That's a, that's a nice feeling to have. But we don't actually know if we have found our bottom 
<laughs> Pardon me, um, but it's it, you know what I mean. Like if if you've got strikers who it, couldn't find their bum, that, 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 some analogy there. Yeah. Look, I mean, what's the bottom? I mentioned our friends up the M1. My my guy was reminding me that they were talking about a game he took his the first game he took his now wife to was was a game against York in the conference, and she still married him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, signed a very watertight prenup, I believe, as a direct result, but. <laughs> But look, that you know, where's the bottom? I mean, football is 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 bonkers, and the the financial situation for the entire pyramid is 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 parlous. It's very very, it's precarious, and no one really knows what the future holds for the for the sport as a whole or the pyramid. So where's the bottom? It's, it could be it could be as low as you can you could possibly imagine. It, that's not to say I think Watford are going to plummet through the divisions. Obviously, Luton had that thirty points deduction and and and, and all that sort of stuff, but. It's not hard to, to 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 disappear into a into a into a footballing abyss, but I th- like I said, I don't think this is the time for those for that level of recrimination. We've, there's plenty of time for us to get into the into the meat of that over over summer, perhaps as we look a little bit deeper into into what potentially has gone wrong and what the future might look like as a re- look like as a result. So I think perhaps it's is it trepidation? Is it a little bit of um, frustration? That we've we've sort of mm. we've had the golden ticket and kind of let it slip through our fingers. Uh, Dave sort of probably summed it up. He's trying to come to terms with it, We're trying to wrestle with how we feel about it. That there's a lot to be said for Championship football week in week out. We've had some fun and games this season. We've had, seen some uh, some good um, some good matches. There's a lot to be said for it, but it, it is tainted by the fact that we a we we've seen what we could have won. And B, we're sort of slightly worried about what the what the future looks like. I think we'll probably find out pretty quickly as the summer progresses. But uh, it's yeah, it's a it's a tough one to to wrangle with. Well, one thing that happened on Saturday, um, we did see uh, a couple of youths uh, make their trip up. Lots of them actually made the trip up, and uh, three of them got on the pitch. Two of them making their debuts. Oh, I've got, I've got the bench players. Yeah, three of them made it. Uh, three academy players made it onto the pitch. Um, of course, actually, one other started, of course. Uh, Ryan Andrews starting. Uh, but Jack Greaves came on again. Uh, well, he started uh, the last home game, but he came on. Xavier, no, not him. Messiah Edwards uh, made it on. And Albert Eames made their debuts. And I went to uh, one of the clubs at our places uh, where, I don't know, it was about f- f- 40, 50 Watford fans at the training ground last week. Got to ask questions. Um, Tom Cleverley was there. Uh, Richard Johnson, the uh, head of the academy. Uh, Jimmy Gilligan, uh, who was also the uh, he's, well, he's the technical director. So he's in, in charge of all uh, the everything for the under nines, all the way up to the under 23s. And a guy called Peter Sharp, who's the academy head of performance. And I'm, you know, we don't, we don't need to tell you all the details and stuff, but basically I left there feeling very jolly and and. and happy with this academy because you know mike and jason we, we spoke to nick cox on many occasions on those first couple of seasons um before he tootled off to sheffield united and then tootled off to where he is now which is manchester united we were a much more dependent club on youth at that point to get some starters but mainly to to fill minutes and it, it really felt like the the work that jono and and jimmy have been doing for the last three years is starting to come to fruition because it does take a while to sort these things out. And Tom being the head coach, it's going to be brilliant because he's not necessarily going to have, unless times do get particularly hard, he's not going to be keeping the academy at a, a distance because he understands it. He's worked within it. He knows what it can do, and he knows the people in it, the boys and the, the, the coaches. So he's going to give them opportunities. I think what I, the thing I like about what Tom said was, I'll, he's always like, I'll give you opportunities, but you have to prove yourself. And, you know, I asked question in it all. I said, you know, what is the hardest, what is the biggest barrier that they have to becoming professional footballers? And it basically came down to commitment and pre- prepared to put the hard work in. Um, and that might come from from Peter, like their hard work in terms of their preparation with, you know, mental approach and physical approach. But then the side of the football, you know, from Jimmy, from, from you know, Richard and from uh, from Tom, it was, they just need to be committed to it. So it's it's going to be a little bit more joined up, I think. That's my, my biggest thing. And they're not going to be taken for mugs. Um, we know we're only a category two, and we know that we are only going to be able to afford a certain level. But I think I like what Jono said. He sort of said, you know, we'll give you a professional contract. You have to earn the next one. And the next one is when you'll get more money. Um, you, we're not going to pay you a big contract for the fact that you are a possibility of being a great player 
So it's great that they that this is coming together and and then Tom as well being part of that will just make it a little bit more I don't know, just a bit more of of a pathway, which we haven't really seen. We haven't really seen if there is a pathway. I think we'll see more of them. But if we do, I know it will be for the right reasons. So that was a good feeling to leave um London Colney with last weekend last week. So end of the season. We've done this many a times, 14 of them, in fact, or 13 others. Um, and we try and think, well, how, can you, how can you bring a season to the end? I believe our first podcast was an end of season awards where Tom Cleverly won an award. I think he won best loan player from that year. Sometimes on top tens. But we decided after WD18 did their alternative awards. Well, boys, Jacob, Charlie, Sam. We're going to go even more alternative. And I decided the only way we could truly be alternative is to take categories that don't make any sense whatsoever to a Watford podcast. So I decided to go way back to probably a Sunday afternoon when I was about nine, when there was uh, a big thing on the television called the Smash Hits Pole Winners Party. So I decided to take all the categories from the 1989 Smash Hits Pole Winners Party, which were dominated mainly by big fun, Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan, but we're going to try and see if we can award Watford players with those awards from this season. Yes, I am trying to make this as positive and as silly as possible because, (laughs) hey, what's the season we've just been talking about? John, have you been around your mum's house recently clearing out your old magazines from the attic or something? (laughs) (laughs) My sister had all those. Um, got, unfortunately, yeah, my sister yeah, had a loud yeah. stereo, so I knew all the songs. <laughs> because, yeah, a bit of context, Smash Hits, for those who aren't aware, who's slightly um, less um, uh, long in the tooth than, than us, Smash Hits was a popular sort of, yeah, music-based magazine, wasn't it, back in the mm. back in the 80s and, and early 90s, I guess, sort of based on yep. around yeah, pop music of the day, really, and uh, pull-out posters of Bros. Lots of posters inside. Bros yeah. was one of the, one of them, and you could put them on the wall. My sister had a wall full of them. We're going to go through these categories. So, category number one, best group. Who was the best group for Watford this season? Jason, who did you put down as best group? By the way, you haven't actually told each other what our results are. Jason? I've gone completely off piste with the first one. and Good. Because, to be honest, I couldn't think of any single group of Watford players that deserved uh, that award this season. You've already mentioned the WD18 guys, and I've actually picked them for organising the WD18 Cup with oh, a that's special good. hat tip to FTREFC because we were twice as old as all the other teams probably added together Speak uh, on display. Um, I suppose we could have said the best group. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Dave. Yeah, yeah, whippersnapper. Um, okay, so I was twice as old as the rest of the uh, the, the players on display. And I thought we put in a good effort. It's just a shame that uh, our manager, uh, Mr. Parkin, lost the dressing room probably pretty early on. Uh, <laughs> All right, Gino. <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> and and, and it, it became quite difficult and, and we struggled uh, performance-wise. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm going for the, the, the WD18 guys for doing a fantastic effort of organising that day. What a great day it was. It was. That's a great shout from Jason. And if there was a vote, that they would get my vote, actually, yeah. having heard that. Um I should remind everyone as well, we did score one goal that day and I did manage to manage to get it. So, you know, it wasn't all bad. <laughs> we'll be back again next year with a, with a new gaffer. God, it's no. every man for himself here, isn't it? Chucking, <laughs> chucking me under the bus, Dave claiming his personal accolades. Hopefully some new players. <laughs> oh, right. See you, lads. <laughs> Hang on, Dave, you said you scored one goal, didn't you score, oh, yeah, didn't you score okay, two? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did score an own goal as well, yeah. Sorry. Before then leaving early as well. While, <laughs> yes. I mean, while we were getting it all out there, we might as well. <laughs> if we weren't going to have this debrief in public, but if, <laughs> if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. Half of you were half cut the half time. Oh, it's cold. We haven't got any balls to warm up with. How, where do I get a beer from? Well, you can't... Dave had to go to a wedding. As a unit, you were a shambles. Talk about losing the dressing room. I never had a dressing room to start with. The, the lot of you were an absolute ragtag and bobtail collection of the most ill-equipped, poorly uh, football-y... Look, Pep Guardiola couldn't have got a tune out of you lot. And I'll be back next year, but with a different team. Oh, <laughs> okay. From one ball fraud grief. to another. Um, so my, my, my best group is a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more conventional than than Jace's choice. I've gone for uh, the trio of Jake Livermore, Ishmael Kone and Edo Kayembe because I think when those three played in the midfield this season, particularly in that 
in that period where we were doing well under Val in that sort of kind of from like October through to January, um, we looked good and they, they were, they were good together. They had a good combination in there, Livermore sort of anchoring things and bringing the experience and solidity to the team and KMB and Kone in the number 80, the side both got forward, both scored goals, both looked more suited to playing a little bit higher up the pitch. Um, so those three, I think combined make a, make a nice trio and they're, they're, they're my best group. They were mine also. And I imagined them to be like a boys to men band. Um, you know, some nice, cool nineties mm. clothing, maybe, um, you know, just a good, sultry, harmonizing type of band that they would be. But I think Jason's won that. I think Jason, you're right. WD team win the from the Rookery end, uh, group of the year. The next one was best solo singer, Mike best solo singer. How could you, how do you interpret that one? Well, the it was a quite close run thing. I was going to give it to Emmanuel Dennis because, as far as he's, he's concerned, he's the only <laughs> yep. the only yep, player on the too. pitch. <laughs> but I think it should actually go to to Dan Backman because he's the only voice you can ever hear <laughs> on the pitch. So, from a from a solo vocal performance, it has to be it has to be Dan Backman. <laughs> Dave, I I also had we, our minds are thinking alike here, Dave. I also had Dennis just because he did everything solo. He's not really much of a team player, is he? You don't want him. You don't want him leading the band. He just needs to go and do his own thing, and he can do his own thing pretty well, as we've seen. We saw a couple of flashes from him. That great goal against Leeds, being the high point, the celebrations, and all that. He's got a bit of flair about him. He's a solo man all day long. Scored, scored his goals and, and left. Is that <laughs> yeah. familiar, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to go for Yasser for for all the things that they said about Emmanuel Dennis, but because he he, he did it in the right way um, for the team, he was capable of sort of on his own picking the ball up, driving us forward, and and sort of sticking one in the in the top corner. So yeah, I I was going to go Yasser. Okay, well mine was Dennis. So I think best solo singer is Emmanuel Dennis. Um, the next two are, are genre driven. Uh, best rock outfit singer, and then best house dance act. Who? could have picked up the 1989 smash hits pole winners party for best rock outfit jason uh i've gone for for cisco cisco sierra Alta. but also a bit of a bit part player yeah. this year but um that. he's got the haircut and he's got the look he's yeah. got that 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 stare there's something about that stare and it and it seems and it's sort of a perma stare it never seems to alter or change through the course of a game so i'm i'm going for cisco Mm. Not not the singer Cisco, but for our Cisco. It, it does, yeah, I can <laughs> no. see that, actually. It does have the look of somebody who would be in a band, some sort of ridiculous death metal band that Mike would go and see in Camden on a Thursday night and send us photos from. I, I went <laughs> I went a bit more Route 1. I went Ryan Porteous. So I think he, he is quite sort of rock and okay. sort of no-nonsense yeah. and loves thrashing around on the pitch. And I can, yeah, I can see him getting stuck in in a mosh pit. He, he, to me, he's our most sort of yeah. on pitch kind of for better, or for for good and bad, our, our most sort of rocky player. Mm, I, I did think about Chap Fatate. Maybe he's a bit more punk than he is rock. He could be a drummer, I think. Chap Fatate. He, I could see him. His arms move quite a lot. Yeah. You know, he sort of has his style where he runs, and his arms are running, sort of going up and down, like he's sort of bashing the drums. <laughs> And he's got a bit of the sort of animal from the Muppets about him as well, hasn't he, really? So he's on drums. Um, Sierra bass? Yeah, he'd be on bass and backing vocals for sure, yeah. Definitely. Lead guitar? I think yeah. lead guitar and vocals yeah. for, for Porto as yeah, well. Yeah, it's a trio. Yeah. You're right. Def- That's it. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, my only other one is for, uh, like I associate Scandinavia with, uh, with rock because that's where I go and watch loads of bands, so maybe Rivich for me. But I think... Uh, Really, Portis has got to get the got to get the um, got to get the award. He if he had a guitar, he'd have smashed it up. <laughs> well, that. interesting, Mike. The, interesting, Mike, that you mentioned Ryevich there because um, he's my vote for best house dance act. You can just see it. He for, he looks for all money like a sort of Euro house DJ. You can see. I can picture him standing at the decks. Spiller, yeah, he is Spiller, you can, isn't he? You can completely, <laughs> completely imagine it. Um, he's very one-dimensional, but he does get the job done. And I, yeah, I can, I can see it. <laughs> John, you've you've mentioned my nomination for 
best house and, and uh, a dance act. But ultimately, house, dance music, it's all based around, well, as the name suggests, dancing, being a club, getting down, throwing down a, a few shapes. Uh, and if anyone saw the press conference after Georgia um, qualified for the for the Euros for the first time, you could see the team, I think, came into the press conference room uh, and were dancing away. And our very own Georgie Jack Fatanti was on the desk, I think, um, <laughs> grooving away. Um, so he was like properly getting into the spirit of sort of a house and dance, almost like a, a festival, like almost like a tent, um, sort of at four o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, so I reckon, yeah, throwing a few shapes, I reckon Georgie Chat for Tanti for me for uh, for Best House and Dance Act. Yeah, I've taken a similar approach for my nomination for that. And it's house and dance. It's all about the energy. And uh, it's something I called out at the time. It's Mateus Martin's energy when he scored the fifth and not so decisive goal at home to Rotherham. And he sprinted from the edge of the box to the, uh, to the rookery, like he'd scored a 96th minute winner. And I called him out saying, well, I was taking a Mickey a bit, but actually uh, afterwards I realized, no, he's shown a lot of passion and energy. So I'm, I'm, I'm turning around and I'm going to give him my nomination for that. I, I got to go with Dave. So I think, I think the Euro house dance and especially in 1989, it would be rave heavy, I think. So I'm definitely going to go with, um, with Ryovich to be a uh, best house uh, slash dance outfit. Uh, best newcomer. I take this as best new player this year. And I think it's, 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 it's got to be quite simple. I think it's Jake Livermore. He was the best that's, newcomer. That's now, not gone. traditionally the best newcomer as mostly in these, these are the best new player, best new Watford player. I think I've got to go with, with Jake Livermore. Yeah, I, I was the same. And, and you may remember he was my choice for for player of the season when we did that podcast, um, and I feel I need to shoehorn him in somewhere. And this seems to be the best place to put him. They usually have a best breakthrough artist in this in this sort of um, in these sort of awards, and there wasn't one. And so, in a rare moment of being quite earnest, I I wanted to give a shout to uh, young Matthew Pollock, who has had a really tough start to his Watford career. He's had to hang around, go out on loan. It looked like he was never going to get started. And then this year he's come in and I thought he's looked really, really solid when he's come in. As a, He's been a, about as centre-backy as a centre-back can possibly be. Um, and he's shown sort of, he hasn't been overawed by situations. He hasn't let Watford down. I mean, there was a bit of a mistake last last season, but this is the first time he's really got a proper run of of games in the te- uh, in the team, I think. Yeah. So but see, I think you're. I think you're. You are. I know what you're saying. Break the is probably the normally a title you would have seen in the Smashes Poland's party, but I think I put him down because one of the other one was most promising new artist. So I think Matty Pollock wins be- most promising new artist, but so, then best newcomer. I've given that to Jake Livermore. Dave. I mean, I've just gone for Ryan Andrews. Really, he does satisfy the traditional criteria for a newcomer award, but. I can see what you mean with Livermore. Obviously, Livermore has had a good season, but it doesn't feel right to me giving a newcomer award to a 34-year-old at the end of his career. I mean, Jake could yeah. be delighted to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Spring this step. I can't believe we're trying to try and apply some sort of uh, common sense to giving Watford players smash hit awards. Smash Come on. Pol- yeah. <laughs> but that's the fun bit, trying exactly. to actually it's, really yeah, think exactly. about it. That's the exactly. best bit. That's why Jake Livermore yeah. wins this one, right? <laughs> Every single player that we've mentioned won't have the first idea what we're talking no. about. No. <laughs> no. So the next one I think is probably the one most open for interpretation. Best single. So we've had solo artist, but best single. And how did you interpret that one, Dave? My my vote for the award goes to Reese Healy's long throw, which was the ultimate one hit wonder. I think he only took one. I think it was that, only that one at, at home in the game, whichever the game was. Was it the game that he scored mm. as well against Southampton? Um, and then he was obviously gone soon after that. He might have took one or, one or two in some of the other away games or something. But they, I certainly only remember seeing him do that one throw once. Uh, and then like the, the other, t- he had another chance to do one, but someone took it short and he was really annoyed. But for that moment, we all thought, wow, we've got a secret weapon. This could be the new thing, but... Like so many one-hit wonders, it was a flash in the pan. We remember it fondly, but we never heard from him again. Didn't even play with Huddersfield when they came and uh, we played them recently, so that was really disappointing. Yeah, so single game, his only single game that he might it felt like anyway he played in. Uh, Mike, best single? I went for the uh, the A side of Watford against QPR because they were uh, four 0 up at half time. So that that the first side of that single, uh, okay. by far and away the. Uh, 
the best of the season by by far, wasn't it? I mean, the it best full of promise. Half. Yeah, well, yeah, full of full of promise. I mean, first. Um, we were playing at the right RPMs, weren't we? Because we scored after what twenty <laughs> twenty six seconds or whatever it was, um, and yeah, as with as with most sort of singles, the first side is really really good. Got to half time four nil up, turned the single over, sort of yes, yeah, an album track really, not really much to to write home about. Nil nil in the second half, yeah, all about that first half at QPR, best single by miles. Mike, I like the fact that you're keeping this um, the the that LP idea because I think the trophies for the Smashers Pole Winners Party. Because yeah. it was so long ago in 1989, it was a it was a, a vinyl disc with yeah. smash hits written on the front front. So I think that's that's very fitting, very good. I went for uh, Yasser Espria's goal and run, best single run and goal away at Norwich, because an individual he did it as a, as a single, but he did it as a single run and a goal. Jason, what about you? I've I've actually gone for a single. And the single I've gone for is finally by C.C. Peniston. Uh, oh, just yeah. just to that sense of humour <laughs> that the uh, the boys behind the uh, scenes of, of having that ready to go for when we uh, yeah when we finally won at home. So that was my vote. I think that's got to win as well. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Now, the next was best LP. And I thought about this. So my rationale, my thinking behind this was an LP is 12 songs, I think. I asked Dave about this. He said minimum. Do you say nine, Dave? I mean, yeah, that's a bit on the on the short side, but I think that would be like the bare minimum for an album. You want more, but I think I have seen albums we've got like nine. Yeah. yeah, don't tell Taylor Swift that. So I went with 12 games in a row for my best LPs. The best run was from uh, Sheffield Wednesday at Home in October all the way to Blackburn Away on the 23rd of December. Now that gave us seven hits. So it's a good album, this, by the way. Seven hit singles for the wind. Two duds. Yep. And that, that's something that happens because, you know, while well, the creative process doesn't you know, stay at height for too long. And then three decent album tracks, which, you know, were never going to be singles, but you sort of would like them. And they were the draws. So that was my best LP for that, that run. I bet Dave and Jace have gone exactly the same as me. I'll be prepared to put... Go I'll on put, all right, so LP, long player, that's what it stands for. <laughs> is it where we're going? Yep. Wesley Hurt, <laughs> Wesley Hurt played 4,320 minutes more than anyone yep. else in the entire team. So Watford's very uh, own no, LP. No, I've not gone that Wesley way. Hurt. No. No. Dave, you've gone. Yeah, yeah, I've gone Wes as well. So that's that, Dave, yeah, have you gone, gone Wesley? Wes. See, he's got the best, the best body of work. Uh, no, you see. You see, I probably I probably didn't go for the best, but following on from the uh, the finally as single, I've gone for the gap between beating Norwich and finally being played at the uh, our last home game of the season. Oh, yeah. Perhaps not the best long play, but it's bloody long. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> that is Scandinavian heavy rock music, Mike. I reckon pop video. So a video, best video. Where what what video, Mike, for you would win the nineteen eighty nine Smash It's Poland's Party for best pop video? Some of us like wrestling for whatever mm. reason, and a pop in wrestling it relates to the noise the crowd makes when something good happens. It's usually when mm. some amazing move or someone unexpected comes out. So the crowd pops, massive pop. So I was thinking, well. What's the best pop from Watford um, Watford supporters? And the, the the one I can remember best and get caught got caught on video is when Arlo was filming away at QPR uh, when Livermore's first goal went in. There was a massive pop for that goal. Arlo got it on video. It was a big game for us, big uh, local derby, full away end. Uh, the, we, we were, the game was meandering a little bit. As Dave said earlier, we could have we got us back in touch with the playoffs. So the pop for that goal, caught on video, Jake Livermore's first away against uh, uh, Loftus Road, courtesy of Arlo. Jace? I've gone for anything uh, starring Matthias Martins because he changed his hairstyle so bloody much. It looked like he was <laughs> styling himself for a different pop video every week. <laughs> well Dave? i went for the video that they play before kickoff with graham taylor and all those clips of the good old days oh, yeah. um you. you know it's a good thing i like it every time i see it i get a little bit of uh, a little bit of joy from it i went for which i'm trying to think which video of all the social media videos or youtube videos did i think i watch over and over again the most and i think it was Ado kembe's long range attempt 
uh, away at <laughs> Ipswich because um, he said, "Is it really?" He said, well, I, "I must watch it at least a hundred times and showing everybody at least a hundred times the audacity of it." But I loved it. So there, there was that one. So I think, uh, whoa, which one should who should win that one then? Ooh, give it to Arlo. Ones. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll give it to Arlo. Give it to Arlo. Arlo. Yeah. Oh, next up, we've sort of already. I think we've already decided this one. Most promising new artist. I think it has to go to Mat- Matty Pollock. I think you're right. I think the, you know, my, I, I agree with you all of that. The fact is, he took opportunities as we young players need to do when he, opportunities came. He sort of took them and he, he, he's kept his head really, and he's he's kept his head in the Watford game. I think for a good few seasons. Dave, most promising new artist. Um, I went for Tom Cleverley. Because uh, the, the the category is actually most promising new solo artist, and he, you know, he's very much stepping up from the backroom staff, from the coaching team. This is his first big gig. We're putting our faith in him, and uh, you know, it has been. I think promising is the word actually for 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 Tom Cleverly. If you're going to pick one from what we've seen from him so far, by no means is it guaranteed that he'll be a success at Watford or anywhere else. But there is promise there. He's he's making the right noises. There seems to be a good feeling about him within um, sort of football circles. I've heard a few whispers that sort of other clubs were looking at him, you know, kind of hearing about him as well when he was just a coach. So I think he ticks all the boxes for this one. Nice. It's better than my one. But Tommy, you know, Matt Pollock's pretty important. Um, Jace. Uh, I went for Georgie Chakvatadze. When we talked about the best solo singer, I went for Jasper Spreer for the, the things that he was able to do. And I think I can see a little bit of that with Georgie with the, with the runs he makes. There was a period during the season when the wheels were starting to come off under Valerian where Georgie seemed to be the one making the difference, trying to carry the, the team forward, carrying the ball forward, you know, making those forward runs, progressive runs with the ball. Um, and there's definitely something there. We might find that he has a brilliant Euros and we never see him in a Watford shirt again, but hope to see him back at the Vic next season. Uh, Mike, are you going with Matthew Pollock for the best new artist? Most promising new artist? I stuck my neck out for him earlier, so let's. Um, yeah, I'm going to give the nod to uh, nod, nod to Matt. Yeah, I mean, I'm desperate to see Jack Vitadze build on 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 those uh, on some of that sort of excitement that we we saw this season. Um, but yeah, I'm going to yeah give it. Let's give it to a centre back. They never they never sparkle at these awards, do so. Let's uh, let's let's get Matty Pollock up on stage. Um, the, there's three that I I could not figure one out for. One was best film. The other one is best music television program. Surprise, surprise, in 1989 that went to Top of the Pops. Uh, and best non-music TV programme. Best film, Dave? Could you come up with best film? Uh, I'm gone for an epic, actually. <laughs> and that was the game on New Year's Day, I believe, between uh, Watford and Plymouth. Plymouth 3, Watford 3. Ah. It was end-to-end. Kept you on the edge of your seat for the whole <laughs> game. Could have gone either way. Both teams thinking they could have won it. And in the end, it sort of... Kind of, it kind of turned out to be our sort of Avengers Endgame in a way because pretty much everything <laughs> after it was shit. <laughs> Jace? Uh, I've gone for Birmingham City at home, so the 2 0 win. Um, one of those films where you're not sure what the outcome's going to be. Is it going to be all right? And then uh, it takes a dramatic turn at the end and a couple of heroes. You've got your, your classic hero duo. You've got uh, the unexpected, unassuming hero played by Mieta Rajevic. And then you've got the local young upcoming hero played by Ryan Andrews. Both pop up, work their magic, and we come away with a 2 0 win. Happy ending. Okay, nice. Best film, well, Michael. I can't believe you've overlooked this. It's a short film, but a, a <laughs> film nonetheless. It's the goal of the season compilation. <laughs> uh, every, I mean, the fact that Watford was so bad in and around the box meant, meant that all the goals of the season, basically everyone was resorting to shooting outside the box. So the, the goal of the season uh, film, because it was a film, it had a start, beginning and an end. Um, and yeah, every, every goal an absolute banger. Um, films these days are far too long, so it was nice and short. You you weren't left wondering at the end of it. All of them went in. There was no no <laughs> ambiguity. The director wasn't there asking you, leaving you there scratching head. Have they left that open for a for a second for a second for a sequel or whatever? Or was the main protagonist doing this? Was he actually imagining all that? Plain and simple. Goal, 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 goal. Entertaining. Exactly what a film should be. Thank you very much. Good night. And also, on it could be also. That could be the best music TV program. It could be like, could be top of the pops, top of the shops, something like that. I don't know. I haven't quite worked that one through. So that could get too, 
Um, two nominations, perhaps that film. Okay, what about the TV programs, Jason? Do you get anything? Yeah, the TV pros. Can I can I start with the best non music TV program? Because mm. Mike, um, you, you you've kind of set it up for me there. Um, what do you call a short film or TV program? Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm a big fan of the Big Bang Theory. And my big yeah. bang theory is that the rest of the team know our strikers are rubbish. And so have been taking these big bang shots from outside the box. And that's why we've ended up with so many goals from outside the 18 yard box this season is Watford's very own big bang theory. Winner <laughs> of the non music TV program award. <laughs> my one hasn't been commissioned yet. But I would sit, I would, I would sit and watch it. And it, it, it would be definitely preferable to some a lot of the fare we've seen at Vicarage Road. And what I want to see is a TV show that is comprised entirely of Watford supporters uh, queuing up to do the Mr Q halftime shootout. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch half an hour of that every week until the day I die, I reckon. <laughs> Commission it now. Yeah, that could have been best uh, best single, but no one actually got it in, got it onto that centre spot, so it couldn't get there. Um, Dave, TV TV programs. Jason, what about your music one then? Well, my best music TV program is Watford for Queens Park Rangers nil, because quite simply, for one week only, Watford were top of the pops. <laughs> <laughs> You've done very well tonight, Jason. Very, very <laughs> well tonight. Now, the, the order I've got these in, I'm going to swap the order around now because I don't think we end on the one that I was going to end on. The One of the awards um, at the 1989 Smash It's Poland's Party, which I believe was held at Wembley Arena, um, was most very, most very horrible thing. What was the most very horrible thing in Watford's season? I have a feeling that Dave and Mike will really know this one off by heart and really <laughs> sell it to us. Go on, Dave. What is the most very horrible, most very horrible thing? Uh, and the nominees are. <laughs> um, but I actually went, Mike slightly stole my thunder. I've actually gone for all the pathetic attempts from almost every single person who had a go at the Mr. Q <laughs> halftime challenge. I just, every week I was turning around to you in the stands, John, just saying, what are they doing? Some of these people must have kicked a football before. When they all look like they're trying to curl it or just like no one even gets it close. Just side foot it full on straight and just at least get it close. Uh, just, I'm dying to have a go. If it comes back next season, I'm dying to have a go. Passing <laughs> judgment on other people's footballing prowess, you lot. Just be grateful that there wasn't any video footage of the, the aforementioned WD18 <laughs> Cup. And if any does surface, we'd all have to retire, actually, from talking about f- football. If any, there's any, anyone sees our, our attempts at actually doing the game that we wang on about for, for hours every week. Um, look, the most very horrible thing for me was to get back to a to a serious thing about the season was that Leeds United away game traipsed up the the M1 to Leeds I don't think Leeds had won at home at the time so it wasn't as if we were sort of entering the the jaws of a rabid Elland Road um the team off the back of you know win after win after win the home crowd going to be up for it it should have been a nervous Elland Road it should have been a nervous Leeds United and Watford just utterly capitulated in that game they followed up with with Sunderland the week mm. after, and they just looked beaten. And in most games, Watford haven't been great this season, but at least they looked competitive. At least they looked organised enough to at least try and stop the opposition scoring, even if we're not going to do it ourselves. But in that game, they were just chasing shadows from from the minute the whistle whistle went. It was it was it was less a capitulation than an immediate surrender. And I just it just felt don't often feel short changed. I think as in a way. Football fan, another football fan, you turn up and you hope your team's going to play well, but you know there's a chance they're going to be naff. But I thought that was that was particularly poor from Watford. And to compound it, I got a uh, speeding ticket on the M1 on the way home. <laughs> so up to Leeds, spent about six billion quid on, on petrol, uh, got thumped 3-0 in one of the most pitiful displays of the season, then got a speeding ticket on the way back. That, my friends, is the most very horrible thing. I was going to say at the end of my LP, <laughs> the song that didn't make it on the album was Boxing Day and Bristol City at home oh, losing yeah, good three, what, a four, <laughs> one, four, one at home on Boxing Day. Because you, you, I know what you're saying, Mike, those were bad games, but they were sort of the catalyst for improving things and to to start the good run that we had in the run up to Christmas. But that was the beginning of the 
not the well the end of Valerian at least. So I'm going to go if that was the most horrible, very, most very horrible thing. Jace, I've gone quite generic on mine, and mine just feels like a, a and and after having fun with lots of the other ones, it's quite a boring and and sad one in terms of just a general season where it of that seemed to start quite promising in that we we felt like we were enjoying being Watford fans again more just seemed to tail off again towards the middle and it just feels like another season of wasted opportunities and going backwards and and just yeah that rankles a bit well something that we could have had a chance of a clean slate and a chance to refresh and it feels like we we yeah we've we've dropped back again that was that feels horrible the good job I did change the order of this because it is yeah. next category Sorry, depressing I don't think this is going to be hard. Now, I don't know your personal preferences, gentlemen, but most fanciable person at Watford this year. And no, oh, hang on a minute. you can't do Harry minute. Hornet. Oh, go on. It's the most fanciable person on the planet. It's not most oh, fanciable is, person yeah. at Watford. And <laughs> the, the answer is clear. It's, it's John Eustace. <laughs> <laughs> you say that, but I, I was thought <laughs> earlier on, there was a story came out today where he'd been fined uh, for something he did on the Being uh, too away, when they play comedy. No, but I thought, oh, you know what, John? Like me, he's put a bit of weight on. He's not. He's not the same. I don't know. Those those big teeth don't quite seem as big. Quite as... hashtag dad bod. Hashtag dad bod. I'm all over <laughs> it. Look, my, my real answer yeah. is the best looking thing at Watford. I mm. think cons- consistently. So I think beauty has to be it has to be there all the time. It can't be sort of up and down. And sometimes it's yeah, makeup on here, and then next morning all the makeup's off, and you look terrible. And not well, you know what I mean. Consistency is what you want. That's what that's what that's what beauty is, and that's what makes you fanciable. That's well, not. I'm, I'm making myself sound very very it- shallow here. Right? Carry on, Mike. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Anyway, the answer is John Eustace, but the the second answer is the Watford pitch is the most fanciable thing on the planet. It looks absolutely gorgeous every week. So I sit up in the I sit up in the press box, um, and the away quite close to the away commentators and the away sort of analysts. And without doubt, within a couple of minutes of one of them arriving, God, look at that! I've had thirty games on that. You know, look at it, absolutely beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? Each and every time, guaranteed. So the most fanciable. Does that, by extension, make Scott Tingley the most uh, fanciful person on the planet? <laughs> Maybe he's best, best makeup artist, surely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he would be best makeup but, artist. Jason, you, you are, are extraordinary <laughs> at this. <laughs> so, Jason, the most fanciful person on the planet. I mean, it, it, it's uh, FTRFC manager Mike. Oh, no, sorry, that's the wrong envelope. Uh, <laughs> it's Wes. It's got to be Wes, right? It's got to be Wes. It's got to be Wes. Yeah. It has to be. I mean, see, again, I've, I've talked about it before. It, he won it at the Junior Hornets event in the summer. There was a long line for him. And every time one child had a picture, their mum had a picture with him also. And I just think the the, the love that he was getting on that day just says the most fanciable person to me. Dave, are you going to disagree? Hard to disagree with Wes. Stunning, isn't he? Um, he's definitely our most handsome player by some distance, but I think I'm going to vote for Anne Swanson. <laughs> <laughs> In fine nick, even at her grand old age. Yeah. See, no. And and on a on a on an important note, it makes my heart sing to see Anne just so active around Watford. I've said it a million times before, but if, were it not for the Junior Hornets, I dare say that we wouldn't be sitting here having this podcast. I certainly wouldn't have had the Watford supporting career I had. We talk about being active in the community. Anne Swanson made sure we were. She was a massive part of, of doing that. And the fact that, that Anne is still there, she's still got that. You talk to her, she's still got that that passion for the football club, that 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 unquenchable desire for the for the football club to keep moving in the in the right direction. And yeah, I look, I adore that woman and everything she she stands for. Uh, she's such an integral part of the football club of what it what it became and what it continues to be um so yeah i think yeah i i love Anne Swanson and i think it's a it's a great shout and it's um yeah she should yeah I, she'll get my vote sorry john and the pitch <laughs> <laughs> a nice way to finish the awards the from the recurrent smash it's poll winners party um 1989 slash 2024 
Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. It felt fun. It felt we laughed a lot, which is something that I think we needed uh, at the end of this season. But it's not the last podcast before our summer break. I am in the midst of putting together a 40th anniversary, uh, looking back at uh, the 1984 FA Cup final. Not just the final, but the run up to it. And of course, as we always try and do in From the Recruit, try and you know gather the fans' point of view of of it week by week or major events like that. So that'll be out uh, on the uh, on the 19th, which is the, the anniversary uh, of the game. Um, but thank you so much um, for listening uh, and spending time with us on From the Rookery End this year. We're back for season 15, and it's going to be a big one. It's going to be huge. Isn't it, Mike? <laughs> um, it's, sort of almost, <laughs> it's, just, it's almost certainly going to happen. Before we go, and this will this will this will test if people listen to the end. Thank you to everyone that's listened this this season. But I want to do a quick mention to um, long time listener Mike Smart. And the reason I want to mention Mike is we originally thought we might try and do this podcast on Sunday at the playoff final, the non league playoff final between Bromley and Soli Hull. Mike Mike lives out that way and is a is a Soli Hull um, supporter as well uh, as his non league club as as well as his son. Cam. So hello to Mike and Cam. But Mike ran the half marathon, the Birmingham half marathon on Sunday before running straight from ending the half marathon, running straight to the train station, getting the train to Wembley to see Soli Hull in the playoff um, final, um, who then lost, unfortunately. Mm. But we were going to potentially get Mike on. We weren't able to do the podcast. So uh, massive uh, uh, shout out to Mike for his, his efforts on, uh, on, on Sunday. And uh, it means he can carry on supporting Soli Hull without worrying about having two teams in the league. So I think it's probably probably for the, for best. the best. Yeah. But yeah, that, a massive thanks to, again, one of the great things about doing From the Rookery End and, um, uh, is, is the, the number of people that we've met over the, over the years and, and listeners that say hello and we've forged firm friendships and I'm sure there are, there are many more to be, to be made. And that's the, the, it's a, it's a hugely rewarding thing to do. We love talking about, um, about Watford. We get a lot out of it, but that sort of extra, element of of meeting meeting listeners and and hearing that people enjoy the podcast is is just massively massively rewarding in it and it kind of makes it all worthwhile so yeah just from from me a massive thanks to everyone who's who's taken the time to subscribe and listen and dropped us a line or or said hello when we've been 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 out and about it it makes supporting Watford um even more uh, even more sweeter thank you much Jason uh, thank you and thank you DCW thank you uh, we'll be back again with more from the weekend very soon and for our 15th season. 15 years. It's a very long time. With plenty of what for things that have happened and plenty more great ones. They're going to be great to come. Come on, you ones!